Ephraim, please. All right. Thank you all. Good afternoon again. Um, we're delighted to be joined by the, our Deputy Secretary General, who's, as you all know, has come back from uh, quite a trip. Um, and so she's here to brief you, but also, more importantly, to take your questions. DSG, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us this morning. And yes, we just got back, uh, myself, um, Executive Director from UN Women and our ASG uh, from DPPA, DPPO, um, yesterday evening. Um, it was a trip that took us about two weeks. Um, it took this long because at the very beginning when the Taliban announced the bans on education and women in the workplace, our consultations were clear that we needed to have a united front in engaging uh, with trying to get the reversal of these bans, the most important thing, women's rights and women's rights and girls' rights in Afghanistan. Uh, so we did embark upon a number of uh, visits in person uh, that were consultative to the region and slightly beyond. Turkey and Indonesia were included to some of the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia. Um, and then on our way out of Afghanistan, um, we did visit Kazakhstan, but also the UK and the EU. And I think this is important because this is a whole of society government approach um, the international community need to have that unified response. We had three things in mind. First, the solidarity and the importance of women's rights and what had been um, taken away off the, uh, off the agenda in Afghanistan uh, with a view to education, secondary and tertiary, and of, uh, in the workplace and very specifically in the humanitarian sp uh, space where this was about women's lives, this was about people's lives and therefore um, double jeopardy, not just women's rights, but the impact of it will be the loss of lives. The second was to get the engagement, to engage with all parts of our community, particularly those partners of ours who had different reactions to how we should deal with this, um, and to engage with the people who are the beneficiaries of the support we give, um, and uh, the women's voices that were very loud before we got there and really said to us, look, this is not about you uh, taking your voice, sir, but you need to listen to us, you need to take our voices, and you need to amplify them with the Taliban. Um, and so engagement writ large. Uh, the third, of course, was to see, is there any opening, any momentum that we could have um, on the political track? All in all, the visits to um, uh, Afghanistan themselves, they covered our stay and uh, interactions in Kabul. We then went to Kandahar, uh, and met uh, there with the authorities and then to Herat where we met with those that have been impacted quite severely um, by these bans. Uh, the meetings in, um, in Kabul started with, as women had asked me, meet with us first and not last so that you really do hear what we want to say going in. They were very clear. They were women from NGOs. They were women who worked to the international community. They were our staff, the Afghan women in our, um, uh, in our system, uh, the mission there. Um, and we also uh, spoke with, with young, younger women um, who are also part um, of some of the work that we're doing with UN Women. Um, we spoke uh, again to the international community just before coming in because some of them are based in Doha. Uh, others from the region, together with the EU, based in um, Kabul. So we met with them in the evening. We had uh, the opportunity to meet with the former President Karzai and the Prime Minister um, Abdullah Abdullah. Uh, we then met with uh, three, four ministers, um, from the foreign minister to ag the agriculture minister to um, the um, refugees and, and repatriation, and also the deputy prime minister. Um, we moved on to, to uh, Kandahar. We met with the shura, the ulema that give the edicts, the, the laws that pass through. Um, and uh, we, we met with the, the governor's office, the deputy governor and his cabinet. In Herat, we visited a uh, mar market situation where, in fact, uh, women uh, were not allowed uh, to come. Uh, some were there because their uh, mahrams came with them. Uh, but mostly we heard um, from the women that now could no longer have the education or the, um, uh, the skills uh, acquisition that they had got to help them with, with working. Um, in, in, uh, in the case of the engagement with the Taliban, uh, their messages were uh, off one script, all the things they say they have done and that they have not got recognition for. 
we reminded them that even in the case where they talked about the rights uh, edicts that they had promulgated for protecting women, they were giving rights with one hand and taking away with the other, and that was not acceptable. In a case where we spoke to them and they started to talk to us about the humanitarian principles, we reminded them that humanitarian principles, non-discrimination was a key part of that, and they were wiping out our women from the workplace. Very specific, the kind of impacts that were, happening, that were having in the medical and in the education field. We have had some, uh, uh, and I would say you know, credit to all those with the push and pull in the international community, have had some exemptions on the medical and on the, uh, the education part of this. We need to keep to push the very limits. At the same time, it's a tough call um, in when you're saving lives. Uh, saving lives um, and maintaining the principles and women and children's rights, a really difficult tension and very fine line to navigate um, as we do this, but we tried the best that we could. Um, we also spoke to, um, we asked them, as you will know, in the past, the Taliban have said, uh, as they take away rights, that in, uh, um, in due course they will um, come back to this. And we said to them, is that uh, in due course 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? You know, let's have a timeline. Let's be very specific about this. Um, and what they would say is soon. And for them, what they want to do is to create an environment that protects women. Um, their definition of protection would be, I would say, hours of oppression. What is it that they want to put into those um, checks and balances to protect women's lives? There will be structures as to how people would be educated and go to work, um, the, the hijab, the curriculum. These for us are all flags that we, red flags that we need to look at and to see that we're not you know, completely losing um, all rights uh, for women and, child and children. Um, we, uh, we pushed on a number of, of other issues as to um, how uh, these exemptions could be extended all the way. We've not seen the history of the Taliban reversing any edict. What we have seen is exemptions that hopefully if we keep pushing them, they will water down those edicts to a point where um, we will get women and, and um, girls back into school and into the workplace. Uh, Martin Griffin is there currently building on the work that has been done uh, since last year by the humanitarian community and our partners. Um, and I hope this trip has contributed to um, reinforcing our demands that these bans are reversed, reinforcing the demands of women's rights um, and girls' rights to be respected, continuing an engagement beyond this trip because this is not a one fix wonder, um, and then creating that space um, for can the international community come um, more to the front, more unified, uh, and the role of Islamic countries, um, the neighborhood, uh, taking much more um, of a stand, um, as we saw in the OIC statement, in the statement of Turkey, and every time I went to any one of these Muslim countries, they did reinforce the fact that Islam did not ban uh, women from education or from the workplace. So trying to build that momentum uh, to make sure that they take a step forward, they are the neighbors, they are uh, engaging, and that the international community support that in our um, trying to, to, to grab back uh, what we lost in the last uh, few months. Thank you very much. Uh, first question to Sherwin on behalf of Anka. DSG, welcome back to UNHQ and on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thank you for speaking with us. I think at the nub of the situation is what you wrote in a 2021 op-ed. You co-wrote that educating girls is not heresy. It is consistent with the faith's first command. The Quran's first word reveals to the Prophet Muhammad was the, the, the first word was read. It then identified our insan, the gender neutral Arabic term for human, as the recipient of God's teachings. Reading is the tool and knowledge is the objective for all Muslims regardless of sex. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you make, made that argument to your interlocutors in Afghanistan and how did they respond? Absolutely I did. I mean, the, I used everything that I know that I have in my toolbox uh, to try to defend and to recover women's rights. And one of those was to tell them that I, like them, was a Sunni Muslim. Uh, how they are the Hanafi school of thought, I am the Maliki school of thought, and both are right. However, uh, when it comes to preventing women's education and their rights, I don't, we, we don't see eye to eye on that. And the ultimate judge will be God. And a lot of what they've done is harming people. Now, I think in one conservative setting, 
I probably pushed a little far because the reactions I got were to remind me that it was even, they do me a favor, it was haram for me to be there talking to them. You'll know that many of these conservative people would not even look at you straight. So it's easy, you know, two can play at that game. I don't look at you either. Um, but it's very important that they, they had the opportunity to speak, and I did. And I gave as much as I think they gave. And we did push. Um, it was clear they want recognition. It's clear that they appreciate and want the humanitarian. And so part of that was um, listening to me, having to listen to me, not necessarily because they wanted to. They were the forward-leaning if you can call them forward-leaning, but let's make no mistake. This is a Taliban that are loyal to the Amir and the Emirate. So if we can push and pull with some of those that would go back to Kandahar and get us exemptions, let's do that. Um, but let's not make any mistake that this is not, uh, you know, these are not people with a halo um, above their heads. Thank you, Beitou. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, DSG. Betul Yuruk with the Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. You went to Turkey before you traveled to Afghanistan, and I wonder what kind of help you were seeking from the Turks, and how did it help you, or did it help you in any way uh, in terms of your engagement with the Taliban regime? Thank you. Yeah. Many of the consultations, I'd say all of them, uh, before I left and then they, when they were in person in these countries did, they gave me greater insights into the engagement with these countries and uh, Afghanistan. In the case of Turkey, they have many of the opposition who reside in Turkey. They have many of the refugees that have come across the border, particularly women, many journalists. And uh, those conversations were important to me on how far to push and the things that had happened in the past that I needed to call them out on that what was different now. Um, and one of those in particular was when they talked about, well, you know, in due course, we will address this. Um, very important voices from the women. Women were very clear to us that, you know, we needed to hear them and take the messages back on their rights and to amplify it. Um, some thought that we should engage, uh, keep engaging. Others thought, no, that, you know, we should just stop. And when they behaved, uh, but what came across from everyone that we met was that you, can't, you can no longer condition or threaten the Taliban. Um, and so I think that that was the kind of uh, negotiation. We were trying to find the pressure points um, of what interests they had um, and how to, to push that with what we have. Um, and I think that we, we, did, um, I think we did fairly well in, in, in transmitting the voices of women. Um, we had former parliamentarians and ministers who spoke to us. Uh, before we went back. You have to remember that what happened before the Taliban came back was a huge amount of hope and an expression of that hope with many women who got an education, who were in decision-making roles, were leaders in Afghanistan, and now that's dashed. And when that happens, there's, there's um, the anxiety and the level of fear amongst women and their future is huge, it's palpable. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Um, you sound quite pessimistic that this idea of uh, the Taliban um, looking at this issue again soon, in quotes, could be a very long time. And the one thing you did mention was pushing for a role of Islamic countries taking up this issue in a more united, concerted way. Can you elaborate on what you'd like to see happen and what you think might happen? Well, you know, Edie, in a number of um, situations before I got there, we had a couple of delegations that went from Islamic countries. It was notable to me that the more moderate ones got a listening to, but perhaps, you know, the statements that came out afterwards that we heard you, but we have our way. Um, the more uh, um, ideological of the delegations that went in got full um, recognition, and this was a good meeting. So I think that, you know, we have to, within Islam, um, talk much more to the moderates about what this means, not just for Afghanistan, but the narrative of other Muslim countries where we are having huge pushback, whether it is Iran or it is Yemen. We have to be clear that this is about women in the Muslim world. So I hope that the next um, two delegations that will go uh, the, from, 
from uh, the neighboring countries, and OIC will be sending a delegation. The first delegation they sent did have a woman on it from Indonesia, and I'm asking for more women to be on that because these are clerics um, who understand uh, where, where women's rights are um, as well as the, as the men. Uh, so hopefully that will go. I hope to see that in the very near future. Each one of these countries engages in one way or another. Um, and in those discussions, they need also to condition uh, the space there for the rights of women in Islam. Um, we, there is an idea, there's a proposal on the table now that the UN, together with the OIC, would co-convene with a number of countries an international conference within March on women in the Muslim world. And this would bring in the issues of Afghanistan, but also the region. Remember that the region, I often you know, say this, and, and when Malala was shot, she was shot in Pakistan. So there is a region problem. There is a region that needs to also come to the, fr the front um, with pushing for the rights of women in Islam. We've seen some um, progress in Saudi Arabia, for instance. Um, I did push on that one when I was looking for a response from the Taliban. I said, well, you know, you're the same uh, school of thought with, with the Saudis, and, and so we'd like to discuss more about that and why there is such a difference. They very quickly, we're not on the same page. So it's very important that the, the, that the Muslim countries come together um, and establish it. It is difficult. We do not have a pope in Islam. We have a Quran, and we have different schools of thought. But we do have rights in Islam. I reminded them that, you know, uh, if it is women in business, it is the first wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was a businesswoman that funded Islam. Khadija funded Islam. Um, if it was uh, uh, coming to, for more knowledge and advice and guidance, it was a younger wife, Aisha, who gave that. Uh, so, and Fatima, and ed education. So, you know, you know, Shawan, you talked about Ikra, the first word in the Quran. Um, it, it is, it's a, it's a religion of light. It's a living religion. And I think that a lot of what we have to deal with is how we travel the Taliban from the 13th century to the 21st. And that's, that's a journey. So it, it is not just you know, overnight. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, is there a discussion of uh, location or dates for this uh, meet Muslim meeting on women in March? Yes, there is. I think it will happen before the middle of March. Um, it's a hosting is uh, still being decided, but it will be in the region. Uh, this was originally thought, could we do it at the sidelines of um, CSW here in New York, or could we do this in the UK? We actually think we have to take the fight to the region, and we need to have this discussion there, and we need to be bold about it and courageous about it because women's rights matter. <laughs> Not Vegas, uh, not Pam, this time. Pam, then Benno. On that note, uh, thank you very much for briefing us, DSG, on uh, a landmark trip. It's Pamela Falk from CBS yes, News. Yes, I know uh, So welcome back. Uh, my question is about how is UN actually functioning today and women in the different agencies in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, as far as I understand and we've seen, there's been an exemption to the NGO ban okay. that allowed for health workers. Is there, there's also an NGO exemption, I mean an exemption for women working with the UN, is that correct? I, I, I don't know <coughs> if that's true. So how, um, did you go through WFP and WHO and all the other agencies operating in Afghanistan? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Look, we have a fantastic team uh, in the mission and the UN country teams who right from the very beginning stood and delivered, took great risks um, to their lives. And uh, they're doing this with partners from the international community, our INGOs, um, and many of the donors that are funding this and, and kudos to them. There were two edicts, one uh, that took the NGOs out of um, the um, out of the humanitarian space and education. In both cases, we had dispens um, exemptions uh, for that on the medical and for the teachers. There was um, the notion that a third edict may come out that would take out international women from the international organizations, the embassies. I mean, this was talked about. I have to tell you, we went with, uh, in our back pocket, three responses to that. Um, it, it hasn't happened so far, touch wood, in the tree of knowledge. Um, <laughs> I, I don't say that it won't, but clearly the pressure that we're putting on um, has, has stopped that rollback as quickly. Um, and as I said, Martin is there. We will continue 
uh, to put that pressure on and engage. But right now, um, there never was um, a ban on, on international women in the international organizations, and we hope it doesn't come. Then Michelle. Thank you, DSG, um, yeah. uh, for this briefing. Benno Schwinghammer with the German Press Agency. Do you think that it would be helpful for your goals to have a representative of the Taliban here in New York, meaning would you think it would be helpful for them to send their own ambassador? I'm not sure whether it would be helpful or not. I do know we have to be very careful with our principles and recognition. Um, and that's a very thin line and a slippery slope if we don't get it right. So I think what we have to give to member states is this is the reality and you need to take a decision on how that push and pull will happen to get the Taliban back into the international community respecting the principles. They argued that the representative here was not theirs and that they wanted to see one here. Um, so we have taken that message back. Um, and I think that this is a very difficult decision to take because recognition is on the line. Did you talk about this with the Taliban directly as well? Yes, yes. Their, 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 um, their ask was that we do not recognize uh, the person that is here uh, because that doesn't, they, he does not represent them and that they wanted that recognition um, and their representative here. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Michelle. DSG, Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, just wanted to, to ask you a bit further, particularly about your conversation with the Shura and Kandahar, given they're the ones who are making these decisions. Um, just to follow on from what you were saying about recognition, did they indicate at all whether these edicts were in response to um, the UN not giving them credentials again, pushing it down the line? Like, it, did they indicate, or anything else? Was it in response to anything? And when it comes to, to getting these exemptions, um, you know, it's everyone's sort of been focused a lot on the aid workers, but what about the women and girls who can no longer go to school or university? Mm -hmm. Is there any chance of getting, you know, watering down those edicts so they can return to school? Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, first of all, the, the Shura themselves are not the ones that will discuss what has already gone by. They will just continue to reinforce what they believe. And one of the things they took up and lectured me on was uh, humanitarian principles. Um, and in my uh, response to them was to remind them that humanitarian principles included non-discrimination. And what they were doing was discriminating against every woman and girl. And that, for us, uh, cost lives. It hurt their communities um, and therefore should be reconsidered. Uh, they, were, they were very um, you know, direct in, in, in uh, holding the line with all the other issues, which were we've done all these things um, and you haven't responded. Um, and I think that that's important that we, we hold them to that. When they told me that they had uh, a law that they'd promulgated against uh, gender-based violence, I now think that that's an opportunity for me to go back and say, OK, can you give me an exemption for the NGOs that work with that? Because if that happens, then many of the stipends, many of the support that goes to the women we saw in Herat, and, and I, we didn't just talk about our, 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 those that work in the humanitarian, we talked about those that impacted. Um, and sitting around a table with one woman after the other telling you about the impact in her life was painful. Um, you didn't know if, between Seema and I, we didn't know who was going to respond because you were choking up. Um, these are very real to the woman who tells us I have no income now and my medication for depression is a pill every other day because I can't take it every day because I need to save so that I can feed my children. To the one who has a father um, that has mental health issues and now she has to take responsibility, doesn't know how. Uh, to the one that is dealing with children with disabilities, the one who cannot feed her kids the next day. That's one room full of pain that's palpable and a reality that we are really risking lives. This is minus 30 degrees when we went to Herat. Um, but in the next room, we have very strong, powerful, organized voices of Afghan women, which is hope. Um, but in that case, they were much harder lined against what we had to do with the Taliban. And I asked them, I said, you know, we will support you for the movement within Afghanistan, build those coalitions so your voice is stronger. But if we stop, what do I say to your sisters next door who can't see tomorrow? You have to do both. And I think that's the struggle, is how to do both and have and make a difference with what the Taliban are doing. 
Um, I think we have to keep pressure on that timeline. It, it's one that we've opened. They were not talking about it because they did so in 1996. But this time, in some of the rooms I went to, they started with it to say that you know soon we would know what they would put in place. Um, I think we have to find ways to engage them to make sure what they put in place isn't as bad as taking away the rights to begin with. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Evelyn Leopold, good to see you again uh, in this room after many years of uh, listening to you. Um, to follow up on what you said, uh, does the Taliban listen to any other nation that can help the UN pressure them, or is it just hit and miss? And secondly, to put it crudely, can they be bought? Any, any, is there any bank or system that they could be told they would get funds if they treated women differently? They have these two mantras. Uh, one is called self-sufficiency and the other one's called alternatives. And I think that that's really difficult to deal with because within the region, which is why we must engage with the region, there is engagement. Even while we were there, there were announcements with some countries of some of the um, investments that they were dealing with. Um, so I, I think they will go to where they can get an engagement and resources will come. Uh, this is a well-functioning um, mindset that uh, zero tolerance for corruption, um, absolute take the max tax that they can take out of anyone to, to, to make sure the coffers are full. Um, and they do have trade. I mean, they trade. So I think that we're, we're up against, um, you know, looking for the leverage we have to bring them to the international community where the respect for women um, and girls' rights, human right, rights are right up front. And, and that's why I think the pressure for us to continue engaging, uh, not to leave a vacuum that will be filled by something else that will take us back decades. Um, this is really important. It's why I visited the UK and, and you know, deep appreciation for what they're doing, the international NGOs and the EU um, in Brussels, what they have done um, in supporting, for instance, monitoring frameworks, which have enabled us when we've seen money uh, being taken astray by the Taliban to get it back. And I think these are important. We, we, we cannot leave and abandon the women of Afghanistan. It's not when it gets hard that we drop off. It's when it gets hard that they see more of us and that we're there in solidarity with them. Ibtissam Azim. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ibtissam Azim, uh, Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I have first one follow up on Edith's question and your remarks at the beginning regarding the um, uh, Muslim majority countries. Could you elaborate on whether you see some countries, uh, uh, that specific countries, countries with more power, uh, that they need to take specific steps that they are not taking. Uh, did you talk about this in, with these different uh, representatives that you saw? And then you talked about the timeline that the Taliban is talking about without really, no one knows what is exactly that. But my question is, what is your timeline? I mean, what, what do you want to see? And is there a specific time where you say, after that, we cannot, that's just going too, too far uh, for us to, to, to um, believe that a change really will happen. Thank you. Sam, we, we hoped that we would stop the slide, that the third edict didn't come for me was a really big bonus. I'm not saying it won't come, um, but I am saying that it didn't come when we thought it would come. We thought it would come at the beginning of January. We thought they would embarrass us. It would come just before we went in, while we were there, just when we went out still hasn't done. So that's a big plus. I think it's very difficult for us to sit here up in New York and determine whether it is for us to say a life can be lost or not, um, that they will fight to lose their lives. I mean, I heard women who were saying, please stand by us, please be with us, um, and please try to help us. They didn't say, put my life on the line. And this is a very difficult decision. And there are different Afghan voices, even amongst the women's community, but all stand against the Taliban and for women and girls' rights. How we go about it, we have to stay together so that we can push and pull. We can find the threads that we tighten and the ones that are slightly looser because we think we must save lives, uh, but tighten them because there are other aspects that we don't have to deal with them. 
um, and this is very difficult. We say, yes, the region must be involved. Um, you know, before I went in, there was almost silence on the part of the neighbors and those countries uh, as to what was happening if, uh, with Afghanistan after uh, the Taliban came back. Um, but in the weeks before, when these two bans went out, we did hear from the OIC stronger language. We did hear from Saudi Arabia. We did hear from Turkey. Now we need more from them. We need them to put resources in there that will support the humanitarian um, uh, endeavor that we have, uh, where maybe it's difficult for some of our partners today to explain to their taxpayers why we're doing this. This is really hard. This is not, uh, this is not easy uh, to do. So there may be some real hardliners that say, no, we're just not going to deal with this anymore. We have so many problems in the world, um, and there is uh, choiceless choices to make because I have competing demands. And if these people are going to take women out of the workspace, we're not going to do it. Then if that happens, we still have to save lives. The UN will continue to stand and deliver, and we get criticized for that. Um, but maybe there are others who will take up the slack because, you know, I can't do it. I've got a mandate that doesn't allow me to do it. Um, so it's, it's not black and white. It's not cut and dry. Uh, there's lots of gray areas and, and, and uh, uh, weaving that we have to do, but always keeping our women right at the center of this, right up front and center. If we keep that focus, I can tell you we will go much, much further ahead. If we start to get involved in the why we can't do it, then we won't do it. Now we must do it because these women matter. And they are a reflection of what is happening to women's rights around the world. And if we drop it on Afghanistan, we will drop it on many more rights of women. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you um, for the briefing. Dawn Clancy with Pass Blue. My question kind of um, parallels Edie's as well. On Monday, there was a US State Department briefing where the spokesperson, Ned Price, was asked, what are you doing to hold the Taliban accountable? He didn't answer that part of the question. Instead, he said, U.S. is the leading humanitarian provider to the people of Afghanistan, providing about 1.1 billion of humanitarian assistance since August of 2021. My first question is, after your visit, do you find that it's proportionate, the effort that's being put towards humanitarian aid or giving humanitarian aid versus the political work that needs to be done, like you said, we don't leave when it gets rough. Do you find that those, the effort to both is proportionate at this point? And then my second question is listening to you speak and you were talking about the women in Herat. Yeah. And then you were speaking about the woman who, or a woman who doesn't have her depression medication, she has yeah. to split it up or dealing with a father who has mental illness and not knowing, no, not knowing um, what to do. So I'm wondering if you, you, know, if you were sitting there now and you were talking to these women and you said, yeah, but the United States is providing 1.1 billion in humanitarian assistance. What would their response be to that? What do you think? Well, I mean, she's speaking to an instance where that 1.1 billion in humanitarian assistance has been taken away because there can't be women to women services. So not, not, not a conversation that makes any sense, right? The sense is that because the Taliban are put in bans, they've taken away 30% of the workforce that in a culture says women to women. So those women to women services were taken away. The cases we made when they said, well, you know, we, we, have, we can go home, we can, we can go online, you cannot deliver babies online. And, and this is important for them to know that there are implications, impacts to what they had done. And one of them was these women I spoke to who because of the services had been cut, that was the, the implication. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and many of them said to us, please don't, don't let us be caught in the crossfire. The crossfire between <coughs> the discussions we have to have with the Taliban and the implications in our countries. Um, and of course, the humanitarian services has to be delivered to save lives. If I could just follow up to that, because another thing that Mr. Price said was that <coughs> he was asked whether or not that humanitarian aid was being funneled through the Taliban, and he insisted, it, he insisted that it wasn't, that it's going right to the people. Then he was talking about the recent decree and how, <coughs> um, regarding women, Taliban, or Afghan women working for NGOs, and how, um, I think he said something like 83% of NGOs on the ground have either suspended their operations or have cut back because of this decree. But then he went on to say that the money doesn't go through the Taliban, it goes through NGOs. So my thought was, well, if 83% of the NGOs have either cut back or have um, 
completely left the country, then where is that money going if it's supposed to be going through the NGOs? I, I don't know all the percentages and, and what context he was speaking in, but we do know that about 30% of the workforce is women. There are men in the workforce as well. Um, I, I think it's a good leverage to say to the Taliban that, look, you wouldn't want angry men without a job because if it's, it's not acceptable for us as a red line, we will not replace um, women with men. Um, and so I think that in, in this case, what we needed to do was try to repurpose some of the funds we had to get cash into the hands of women. And within the UN system, that's possible. Within our INGOs, that's possible, and we're looking at that. Um, but yes, the loss of women's, uh, women's service to service, I'm not sure, sure that it's as high as 80% um, writ large. It might be in specific cases, um, but um, it's a high percentage. I mean, there are thousands of women. In, in one instance, I know three or four INGOs came together, told me out of the 59,000 um, uh, employees they had, 15,000 were women. And, you know, this, this, it, it, it just, you know, that's it. Women get blanked out. They disappear. And, and that, that's our concern. And, and it does, it is more 10% of what we are giving uh, support to. The, they are female-headed households. So what happens to them? Um, so th these are... These are implications that we're working much more on to be definitive about. We did. We were asked by many Afghan women that you know there are, they believe that are that are not reaching uh, the women that should be, um, but it really wasn't from necessarily the international community. There were a number of bilateral donors, um, and we don't have oversight over that. We have sight over what um, is coming through the um, uh, the UN and what is coming through our international partners in the humanitarian sector. When it disappears, as I said before, there is a really good monitoring mechanism, and we can tell you in two or three places where we, it was reported, and we were able to go back to the authorities, both in Kabul and in the province, um, and that was rectified. Maggie, and then we'll go to Yvonne online. Deputy Secretary General, it's Margaret uh, Bashir, Voice of America. Um, you said you were transmitting the voices of the Afghan women to the Taliban. My question is, did the Taliban even hear them? I mean, did they care? And what did they mm -hmm. give to you as an explanation for, for why they need to have these edicts? I mean, what is it about the women that they, they feel threatened by? Uh, hear us? Yes, they did. I mean, as I said, some of the times we pushed some of these messages pretty hard. The reaction wasn't pleasant. Um, care, it depends whose uh, definition of care. These are people who think that they are protecting women. So if you're asking them whether they care or not, and they will tell you, yes, we do. We are protecting our women. And what are we protecting them from? They were protecting them from Western values. Um, and what we want is to make sure that they are, um, they are gaining education. They never denied education for women was a right, nor in the workplace. What they said was the type of education and the type of work. Um, and in many cases, um, you know, for them, this was about the structures of separation, of hijab, of curriculum. Um, and so, you know, I think that's what we're pushing is to say, well, okay, if you think women should have an education, let's see what this means and how you're going to bring them back. Um, I mean, my, my definition is that, no, I don't think they care. Um, if they did, we wouldn't have the ban in the first place. Uh, you ask them, they will tell you, yes, we care because we want to protect our women from, you know, values and um, rights that are not ours. And we disagree with that. We disagree strongly that Islam preaches um, uh, the rights and values that they are dictating. Yvonne Murray, uh, RTE you. on screen. 